there and welcome aboard. This is the Marine Conservation Network YouTube channel. And I hope you're all having a wonderful day. We're out in Santa Barbara and we're here today with Jesse. He is in Maine. He is one of our famous fishermen out there that is putting food on your table and helping everything to grow and go into a better future. Good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh... Well, we're here to talk to Jesse because we know everybody knows where they get their fish. They get their fish from their fishermen, that the commercial fishermen that come into town, bring the fish in. They know where it comes from, but what they don't know is what the fishermen are facing and what they're trying to do to make things better for everybody else. So Jesse, before we get started, tell everybody a little bit about where you fish from and how long you've been doing it, a little bit of your background. Sure, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I come from a, a recreational fishing background actually, um, where I was sponsored by Hobie Kayaks and Ocean Kayak and a few other companies. And I was a recreational fisherman. I also had a radio show, which uh, focused on fishing. And through the radio show, I had some guests on from Deadliest Catch. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I, maybe I could do that. And then I ended up in Maine. I chased a love uh, interest and, and uh, moved up here with her and, and got on a lobster boat here in Maine. So my three proteins of the ocean are which are pictured behind me here are the bristol bay sockeye salmon our uh, gulf of maine lobster and our gulf of maine sea scallops now how long have you been in maine how long have you been a fisherman in maine this is my third year here in maine um and uh right out of mid coast booth bay harbor is where i lobster out of and we go from three miles to maybe 40 miles out to sea, depending on the time of year and where the lobster run is at the time. So um, have, you, have you seen changes from the time that you've been there? And you've only been there for three years. That's not a really long time in one spot, no. but have you seen a lot of changes just from the time you got there to now in the short time? Yes, um, there, there's definitely changes going on. COVID was really a big factor for, for this neck of the woods with the birth of work from home. Um, we've seen a change in who's living here in Maine. Um, so we have people coming from out of town who are buying a lot of property here and some don't want to see work in waterfronts and, and we're facing some challenges in, in that respect in recent years. Um, as far as climate goes, we are starting to see some, um, not just invasive species, but expanding species as the waters warm up where you would typically see south of Cape Cod that are moving northward, um, some of which uh, predate, uh, there's predation on the lobsters uh, amongst other fish too. I mean, you have the black sea bass coming up um, and the stripers moving, straight bass moving more and more north and they love baby lobsters. It's some of their favorite food. What about the weather? I mean, we all know that climate change is happening all over the place, some worse, some better. How is that affecting your business or the fishermen over there? Is that Are they having to deal with a lot of more stressful weather events? Um, well, we're prepared. I think we're prepared for the weather and as far as um, seeing more storms. Luckily here in Maine, we're made up of a lot of coves, and river systems and islands and peninsulas. So luckily for us nor'easters as we call the, the storms uh, and as as far as hurricanes go we have some advance notice so we are able to prepare for it rather we take the boats out of the water secure the floating docks um and and any of these marinas as you would anywhere else we have a little bit of time to prepare for for things like that Good. the what we don't have really the means of of preparation is for the fresh water that we've had this season now this is something new this season where the entire summer was just rain and rain and rain and we have some big river systems here in maine uh the kenny beck river is one in my area a big one and it, a lot of fresh water is, is heading out into our sea and it's creating a brown algae oh. that then to the bottom and creates dead zones so we actually had quite a scare this summer where fishing for lobsters is usually pretty good. Um, and this season, because of that brand algae bloom, we were seeing zero to eight lobsters out of 100 traps in these areas where typically in August we are seeing considerably good numbers. 
And, and that was pretty scary for a lot of folks. We, a lot of guys on the water here that had been out here for 50 years, had never seen anything like that. Um, so that, that's an immediate concern that we have. Um, and then what we're seeing in changes of the climate. Okay. That's, and that's understandable. We have a lot of fishermen have to find different areas to go to and different things to fish for. Are you finding that you're having to do that for yourself as changing what you're fishing for or where you usually fish? Uh, well, for us, yeah, we, we can make an accommodation to make these changes. We have a boat that's big enough to go further out to sea if we have to. Um, you do have, though, a lot of fishermen who are uh, in river, inshore fishermen on boats that you really wouldn't want to take 20 miles offshore. And unfortunately, they are quarantined into these areas uh, because that's where they are. That's, that's the areas they have available to them. And they have a, a shorter season where we're fishing year round for the lobsters. A lot of these folks are, are only fishing a few months out of the year in these inshore areas that, that can accommodate the boat that they're using. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Um, I, you said something about the economy. Now I know because of COVID that affected a lot of businesses and a lot mm -hmm. of fishermen out there. Um, I read in an article that there's some waterfronts in Maine that are fighting against having residentials built in replacement of the waterfronts. Is that happening where you're working out of, or is that all across Maine? Um, yeah, various places. See, yeah, with people moving in from out of town, and then they're getting on the councils and on the boards of town, you know, town boards, and they're deciding they don't want to hear lobster boats at 4.30 in the morning, and, and they would rather have condominiums and boardwalks and, instead of working waterfronts. Um, this also creates a problem for our younger generations here in Maine because you have, let's say, a young family and they go get a house loan to buy a house. Well, people from out of town who are more wealthy and they're older usually too. They're sometimes, most of the time, even retired, of, you know, in that age group. And um, they're just outbidding these young families, you know, even with a house loan, they're saying, well, we'll pay you cash at an, ex an inflated amount of money. And they take these properties. So last check, it was two out of five graduates from Maine high schools would be able to remain here in Maine based on the housing inventory and the cost of living. And that's in every county in Maine, whether you're in rural mountainous areas or right here on the coast. And the coast is hit very hard. It's a very beautiful place. A lot of people love coastal Maine. It's very picturesque, very postcardish. And, and that's something people flock to. So anyone getting into the industry, it's becoming difficult. And, and the average age of a lobsterman now, I believe, is 50, 55. Oh, and wow. these younger folks can't get into it. And at, at this point, I should also say, for me, let's say I want to buy a or or attain a lobster permit here in Maine, it's about a 15 year waiting list. Um, wow. that happened. So the only new permits that are being issued are for student permits that are carrying on into their adult permit. If you take the property being taken up combined with the lack of young folks that we have remaining in Maine, it, it's something down the road that we may see a really big issue with as far as uh, our fishermen you know, here on the coast and also the cost of getting into this fishery um, or any other fishery, you know, you're looking at probably a quarter million dollars just to get in. What do you see happening with your business specifically with, uh, with all these changes? If the residentials start coming in and taking over the waterfronts, the working waterfronts, what do you see happening with um, the fishing industry? Do you see that going down? more and more or do you see well it will they'll be along? yeah oh they'll be they'll, now luckily some of these towns like harpswell for example um in, in bailey island and in a lot of these great coastal fishing communities have ordinances in place that protect working waterfronts so they're zoned that way so no one would be able to come in and just buy it to make a resort or make condos or borrow it's designated shoreline for working waterfront and it's required to stay that way so luckily we have that on our side okay. we also have a great organization called the island institute and they're involved with preserving working waterfronts and not only that but evolving them to include aquaculture like oysters and seaweed farming and to really uh, fill in gaps in some of these working waterfronts where the lobstering may have left 
um, the ground fishing may not be there. So we have great organizations like them. We have the Maine Coast Fishing Association, Maine Lobstermen Community Alliance, Maine Lobstermen Association, who are really on the forefront of maintaining our culture and our identity. And our downfall, it wouldn't just be us. I mean, we're talking a bakery that makes lobster shaped cookies to banks who are giving us our boat loans <laughs> to, um, you know, schools and, and tax base, you know, um, they say every lobster operation supports five land-based jobs. Looking into um, some of the articles and information out there about the waterfronts, correct me if I'm wrong, but a majority of the waterfronts that are there in Maine are not like a big harbor like we have here in Santa Barbara. They're mm -hmm. one little spot, enough for mm -hmm. maybe a couple boats at a time, and that's about it. Is am I correct about that, or or is yes, it we're very we're we as you know we we've got the only state with more coastline is Alaska than the state of Maine, and it's not because we're stretched. I mean, you would think California's got a huge coastline, and it does, but it's because our coastline is so jagged and it goes way up inside and outside, and there's islands and. And if you were to stretch that all into one straight line, then that's a lot of coastline. Right. Um, so, yeah, it, it's which creates it's isolated um, right. for someone out there on the West Coast. You might associate it with the Olympic Peninsula and Puget Sound, like Woodby Island and all these different islands. You have to take ferries to. And, and you, you know, that's where the saying goes. You can't get there from here. Um yeah. Because, you know, it, like I, I made a Facebook post the other day where it's a lot easier for me to get to where I'm going on a boat than it is a vehicle, than a car, because a car, yeah. you have to go off the island, up the peninsula to the mainland, wow. back down another peninsula, you know, so you're talking a 40, 50 minute car ride you can accomplish in about 10, 20 minutes in a boat. Wow. Um, so that isolates these, these little ports and harbors and, and where even if you go further south of us to say Gloucester, Massachusetts, where you have a lot of towns like Rockport, Gloucester, Beverly, Salem, uh, Manchester by the Sea, Essex. These are all towns that are kind of together. You know, you can drive from one to another in 15, right. 20 minutes. Now, uh, what is the, what would you say is the percentage of the fish that's caught, that's brought in, the lobsters, the salmon, whatever, whatever? How much of that do you think stays locally and how much of it is shipped out to other states or, you know, other countries or anything like that? Um, that has changed in over the last few years, and it's actually affected our price. Where China and and some of our Asian countries are typically big buyers of the salmon or lobster or scallops, etc. Um, and with the political climate and COVID and and some other factors, you're seeing some changes in that. Out west, you're seeing changes in the Dungeness crab price have dropped considerably because of the Asian market. Um, you also have for our salmon, for example, this past year in Bristol Bay, we got 50 cents a pound for the salmon. Um, Russia is funding a war and a part of the way they're funding that war is by flooding the market with cheap, cheap salmon, wow. um, which drives down the price. In fact, the chum salmon uh, collapsed. The, the chum salmon uh, economy just collapsed into nothing this past season. Uh, for pink salmon, the Russians sold or they, they put out more salmon than we had in our entire fishing forecast for Alaska, um, which brings great challenges um, to our marketing. Um, you know, because if you go to the store, um, especially this time of year, where you might find fresh sockeye, especially on the West Coast, you know, you're seeing what between 18 to 20 something dollars a pound. Well, we got 50 cents of that. Um, so, wow. you know, that's, that's, uh, the processing now I'm not going to take away from processors. There's a lot to it. There's a lot to market and there's a lot to transportation and the infrastructure is, is a big deal. And that's um, one thing the public does not understand is that when you get the fish from the fishermen, it's not just a matter of going out and getting it. You've got all these other middlemen, so to speak, that you've got to mm -hmm. take care of and pay for to get that fish onto the table of the residences or restaurants, you know, wherever you're having, having it go to. What kind of changes um, have you had to make though to adjust to the climate change or the economy change? What kind of changes in your particular business have you had to kind of turn around? 
Well, fuel is a, is a really big part of it. Um, you know, when we're, you know, looking at you're in Alaska, for example, and you're paying maybe $7 a gallon for diesel, um, you know, that means you pretty much have to put on 500 pounds of fish just to start at zero. Um, so a lot of people are foregoing having that extra crewman. Um, and by foregoing that extra crewman, um, it brings up safety concerns. There's less people doing more work. And the risk factor to that is a little, little greater when you have less people doing more work. It's less sleep for those less, less people. And, and, um, and that's one way of trying to save money on that respect. Um, you're not maybe eating as well for that season. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, in, in some folks are more equipped to handle these things than others. Um, like I say, especially here in Maine, um, there's 5,000 individual business owners who are on these boats. Wow. Each boat is a business owner. Each boat is a self-run uh, owner-operated boat with maybe two or three people on board. And, um, and it's a very independent operation. We don't have a big parent company who's helping and funding us and and, you know, this is really individual families who are, who are doing this on their own, um, you know, and, and they make big sacrifices, you know, to do okay. these things, whether it's a father or mother who's out there missing, you know, school activities and games and recitals and because they have to be out there on the water um, making ends meet. Um, our health insurance, we don't have a health insurance, you know group health insurance policy this is all individual health insurance policies and you know if, if you ever had to deal with that as a family you know with young ones and, and a, you know a family of four and you're you're not this isn't an employer paid health insurance policy um you're also looking at the regulatory needs that we have to pay for um, the latest thing we have lobstering here is we're, we are doing our best to protect the North Atlantic right whales here. Okay. And the way we do that is we've taken 30,000 miles, 30,000 miles of rope out of the water um, in the recent years. And the way we do that is we have trawls. So we have uh, a set number of traps in between two buoys. Okay. And we've expanded the number of traps that we put in between the buoys because that's that much less buoy line in the water. Oh, okay. um, we've put weak links in our, in our rope uh, down various lengths. So if a whale entangles in it, they, these weak links are made to take about 300, 500 pounds of pressure and then they break. So this wow. frees the whale from being entangled. Um, that's wonderful. We, we also use weak rope. So it, let's say it, the link, it's not to the link, the weak rope will break under a certain amount of pressure. Um, we also identify all of our rope with, uh, we, we splice in different colors. So let's say we have an entangled whale and they were able to retrieve the, the rope attached to it. By looking at it, we can tell you where that rope came from. So therefore we can tell you where the whale was entangled. What is your opinion as far as the off, um, offshore windmills that, are, that they're putting out there? Do you think that's affecting the whales coming in closer to your traps or not? Well, that's the million dollar question. As far as the right whales go, for us here in the Gulf of Maine and coastal Maine, we were really done wrong, I think, on a few different levels by NOAA. Um, also by the um, Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, wow. and we were red, we were red listed, um, and we were red listed with zero evidence of whale deaths or entanglement. Um, we had two since two thousand seven, I believe, and they were both freed. Um, we have reason to believe that the right whales have moved away from inner uh, coastal Maine to follow a food source further out to sea. Right. Um, where now if you take Stellwagen Bank, Cape Cod, Nantucket, yes, there are right whales there. I've personally seen right whales at Stellwagen Bank um, where we should be very conscious about setting traps in, in these particular areas. However, they accused us of entanglement that for all intents and purposes didn't exist it's all on theory and, and possibilities 
And then when we asked Noah, um, well, what about our weak links? What about uh, the safety precautions that we have done voluntarily to protect the right whales? And they just said, well, it's not conclusive yet that we don't have any information on it. So therefore they expand the danger zone for right whales into a bigger space than what is realistic, uh, what is um, probable based on extrapolation. Uh, we fought that. We took it to federal court wow. and we won um, through the Maine Lobster Association. We, we uh, 10th district or I'm not sure specifics, but the federal court sided with us saying, look, you know, there's not enough information for you to be, you know, uh, dealing such things to an industry. I mean, let me tell you this, the coastal Maine um, as a whole employs 343,000 people annually earning over $15.8 billion, which equates to over $37 billion in gross domestic product. And that's according to NOAA's office for coastal management. Wow. So you take a scenario like that, and, you know, red flag us as an industry over something that there is no evidence of, well, it causes us to come to the defense of ourselves. Right. Now, by doing that, we were given a bad name, like, oh, we're deniers, we're science deniers. But in truth, we are science demanders. We are telling NOAA and their partners that, they're not doing enough, that there's not enough funding for the science and that they can't extrapolate a number based on minimal study to jeopardize such an industry and such a tradition and a culture. So we're not asking them to vacate their science. We're not asking them to, or we're not asking the federal government to throw it out the window. We're asking for more of it. We want to be more informed. We want to have tagging on these whales to show where they're going. We want more flyovers. A great example of this is, is what they're doing in California with the Dungeness crab in, in the Southern District with the San Francisco Bay Area, right. where they have regular flyovers. And if they see a certain amount of humpback whales, then you take your gear out of that area. And then, uh, and then the following few days, if they see the whales have moved off, then you put your gear back in that area. And, it, and the regulatory process is done in real time where we can say, okay, the whales are here. We have to protect them. Okay, they're gone. Now you can go fishing again. Where here on the East Coast, they're taking a study that may have been done three years ago and throwing that number against the wall and saying, well, gee, we better be on the safe side and just cut you off. And, and what we're saying is, well, no, if, if it's that important and if it's that vital and there's only really only 340 whales left, then you probably should spend a little more money researching this and, and making sure that they're going to be OK and we're going to be OK at the same time. Why do you think they just kind of mm -hmm. jumped on it without all the evidence to back it up? Well. Now you're getting into conspiracy theories, but <laughs> um, well, a big part of it is to push an agenda. So exactly. here, here we are at the front door of our next revolution, which is this green revolution. And what's important to remember is just because something feels good and looks good and tastes good doesn't necessarily mean it's good for you. Heck, at one point we thought cigarettes were good for us. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. having... Having this knowledge now of what we consider to be progress and looking back historically where we find it wasn't good for everyone. Right. Well, now we have to take the responsibility of saying, OK, these windmills in their construction process, which involves very, very heavy sonar, which the Navy has already admitted to have, have done very bad things to marine life. Exactly. Um, and the construction, I mean, it's industrialization of our ocean. Uh, how does electromagnetic fields from these transmission lines affect the hunting ability for ground fish like cod and haddock um, who use electromagnetic senses to hunt or maybe reproduce, find mates? Um, you know, you find this in a number of ground fish species. Our scallops, our scallop beds, our baby lobsters that are floating around before they 
hit the bottom um, are they spend the first part of their life floating. Right. So now Noah and other entities, uh, including these windmill companies, large energy companies, will say that um, it's false news that the all the, these dead whales on the East Coast are done by the windmills and all of these uh, ground fish issues are happening by the windmills. And it's easy for them to say that because there's no research on it. Right. It hasn't been funded. So if they, they can tell us, well, we have no evidence that the windmills are doing this. Well, that's because you haven't studied it. Right. Or we have no evidence that we, 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 we see nothing saying that, you know, electromagnetic fields affect our ground fish. Well, that's because you haven't studied it. So it's easy for them to stand behind that. And because green energy feels so good to the public, people just jump on that train blindly saying, well, these, these windmills are great for us. This is what we need. This is what we, we want. But this process, like all fisheries processes, it can't be handled with a sledgehammer. It has to be done with a scalpel because okay. we have so many factors involved. And, you know, all we are asking for is more proof, more responsibility and to be liable for, for these actions and, and to take um, appropriate actions to maybe hit the pause button. Some believe that the right whale problem is actually being weaponized by these interests to get us out of the way. Right. As, and we are the low hanging fruit. We don't have giant uh, lawyer groups and, you know, let's, let's say, we're, we're going to, we would argue that the biggest cause of whale deaths is ship strikes. Well, no one's going to go after the shipping industry, you know, um, they're just too big, you know, and, and so they come after us instead. What can the public do? What can the public do to make sure that this is pushed forward and that you keep your industry and you keep able to do what you need to do in order to take care of everybody else? What can the public do to help you out? Well, the public, you know, education, education and knowledge is, is the best ally we have for what we're doing here. Um, you know, we have a lot working against us. If you take some of these documentaries on Netflix and and whatnot, they'll show the fishing industry and vilify us. You know, they'll 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 make it look like we are taking as much out of the ocean as we can and, and all the bite catch and, and the the truth is that 90% of the fishermen and whether it's Alaska or Maine and everywhere in between are owner operated small vessels. Um, and where these documentaries are showing you boats, sometimes as big as three football fields and factory processors. And what's important to note is on many of these documentaries, you will not find one piece of footage from U S fisheries. They're showing you videos from overseas fisheries and fisheries that do not involve American fisheries. Uh, we are the most regulated in the world. Um, let's take a great example, Bristol Bay sockeye salmon. Right. Two summers ago, we saw the largest run in recorded history. More salmon came back than ever recorded. And this goes back to the 1800s. Okay. And that is because of our management. So in Bristol Bay, we'll sit on our anchor and our biologists and, and teams that have sonar counting towers. And it's a great opportunity. Let's say if you're watching this and you're a college student and you'd like to be involved, you can go up to Alaska and you can be a part of this, the, the, the biology side of this, you can be a part of the, of that. Um, and so they're looking for certain numbers to get upriver to escape for spawning. When they get those numbers, then they allow us to fish. And this happens on a daily basis where they'll get, they'll, they'll see how many fish get up river, take a look at it. And they'll, they'll say, okay, well, you guys can now fish the last three hours of the incoming tide. And then they'll wait again and they'll say, see what they've got in. And, and, and incrementally we're allowed to fish more and more as they get the numbers they're looking for. And they keep us at bay the entire season because they want to make sure that the, it, it's a very large um, sample of genes. They want to make sure it's a, it's not just one group of fish that gets up river. They want to they want to see um, 
a, a really big, broad scale of genealogy going up these rivers throughout the season. Okay. And uh, that keeps a nice, healthy population coming in. Um, and that's a big success story. You know, we make sure the native population get theirs in the subsistence nets. Um, we make sure that um, if there is a shortage of a certain fish, like the king salmon, which we're having a, kind of a problem with right now, right. that there's emergency closers that they say, okay, well, look, as much as we hate to do it, you guys can't go fishing. Uh, you, and I think, do you think there's well, nothing in like National Geographic or like the, um, the documentaries that you were talking about? Why do you think it's mostly on out of country fisheries as opposed to U.S. Um, fisheries? Why do you think it's because not- they're easy targets? They're they're unregulated. Um, they are they 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 also flood our market with their overseas seafood, which drives down our price. And it also uh, takes away from what we're catching right here in your backyard. Um, what we export to what we import is ridiculous. It's is we are exporting more of our fish and importing more of other people's fish. And we're talking very unhealthy farm raised fish um, that are sea lice factories and putting disease and, and they're given hormones and they're given um uh, antibiotics and, and, and the jury, which is the processed products, when you process these fish are creating dead zones where these big net pen farms are. They're also infecting natural run fish, right. as we've seen in the Pacific Northwest, especially on the Fraser River, where fish farms are, are polluting and in Iceland, we're seeing it. Um, and, and when we have a viable, sustainable product from right here in the U.S. that you can that is available, um, and unfortunately, the price points make it easier to get the stuff from overseas. It's when you buy U.S. fish, caught fish, you're making sure you're buying a product that is protecting the environment and protecting our ecosystem. Um, and you're taking a big risk if you're buying from overseas because their regulatory processes allow for these documentaries that show these horrible, horrible things. What is your what is your hope for the future in the fishing industry with Maine or in general globally? What is your hope that we can all accomplish by having videos like this and having organizations like us out there bringing together networks? Uh, I Well, I, I hope that it would encourage people to try new things in their backyard. Um, and not just for here in the U.S., but people in Thailand, people in Japan or, or England or, or wherever you may be on the Mediterranean, eat more of what your local boats are bringing in. You know, you don't need to have exotic foods from here, and there, and everywhere. We've got it all right here. Exactly. Well, thank you, Jesse, for taking your time out of your fishing to sit down with us today. I really enjoyed it. I, I know our audience enjoyed it. And like I said, you opened the door for a lot more information to get out there. So we would definitely love to have you back on our channel at a later date. There's a lot more information that I'm sure you can bring to our followers. And this is fantastic. It's really important that we all work together and with our local fishermen, such as yourself, and even here in Santa Barbara, and Mm -hmm. learn where our food is coming from and what we can do to protect it and conserve it. Because our future is really on a teeter-totter so to speak right now and we really mm-hmm. need to protect it well thank yeah, you really for is. joining us today this is kimberly ray the marine conservation network this is jesse our famous fisherman in maine and i hope you got a lot of information out of today's interview please make sure that you subscribe to our channel like and comment let's get a discussion going on this and let's make some beautiful changes out there guys remember together we make oceans a difference and have a great day Bye, Jesse. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.